Uh, I had my title of my uh, original proposal to be Financial Meltdown Regulation and Risk Measures. If anybody has been taking a look at the markets recently, Financial Meltdown is back in the, in the headlines. Regulation also should be because of MF Global and the $600 million they apparently embezzled from their, their clients, their customers. So uh, hopefully this is uh, something that, that still applies today and hopefully it doesn't have to apply much longer maybe. I don't know. This meltdown stuff is, uh, seems to be getting everybody. So uh, a little past history. Oh, I got to get it right. Uh, of what's, what's gone on. In 2000 we had this dot com bubble. You all remember that, right? Anything that had dot com li uh, listed with it, uh, people were buying on the stock markets. Uh, buying it left and right because even though it didn't have any kind of valuation and it had never made any money, it had potential. And so they were buying it. From that, uh, and then of course that fell apart because those things without potential didn't live up to any kind of potential and that's where you go. Uh, we had the housing bubble, which we seem to have many people that have taken part in. I know as someone who owns a house, I, you know, if you ever think about selling it, good luck on that one um, because uh, the, the bubble was, was so much. If people have been in houses for much longer, then maybe they're okay, but for now there are many people who's ho who are underwater. Uh, in 2008, we had liquidity problems. Uh, that was uh, all of these houses are not worth as much money and the banks now don't want to lend as much and so they stopped lending and that le that meant that they uh, I still want to allow this to make some changes. Sorry. Is it okay just to tell them no this time? Just hit no. Alright, so we can keep on going. Thank you. Uh, so uh, they didn't want to lend anybody because the people didn't have as much uh, p wealth on paper as they thought they did and they weren't as good of risk. Um, be beyond that, you had individual companies not trusting other companies because uh, the question of valuation was thrown in, into, into question. I mean, first of all, it was just people didn't know how to value things properly. Uh, now we have sovereign debt problems. All you have to do is look at Italy and Greece uh, or Portugal or Iceland re more recently. I mean, all right. Well, so my idea is to talk about risk. This is really my specialty. I, I believe a lot is done with risk and that uh, people take risk every day. Uh, when I cross the street, I take risk. We'll have to see why that is. But when I cross the street, I take a risk. Um, when we do anything, we take risks. But uh, mostly, this is true. Everyone wants more than they presently have. I don't know there are times when I want less than what I have, right? But we all want more than what we presently have uh, for less effort is what it seems like or for less of some investment of, of our time, of our energy or something. So uh, if the movie Wall Street famously said that greed is good. Well, greed may be good, it may be bad, that's up for you to determine, but we're all guilty of it. And it may be for different reasons. Your greed may not be for financial reasons. It may be something else. But we're all greedy. It may be that you want more books or more time to read or something. We all want something more. Um, people are often willing to take risks in order to have more. Or they're willing to uh, not take the risks in order to keep what they have. But that in itself is a risk too, once we define what risk is, which is coming. Uh, so that's the question, of course. What is risk? And let me say this, uh, I do this all the time with my classes and some of my colleagues, you know me well. If there's anything I'm saying that's not clear, please ask, stop me, because I don't want you to keep going, what the heck's he talking about? Because this hopefully builds upon itself. So if you've got any questions, please feel free to just interrupt me. So here's what risk is. <laughs> According to businessdictionary.com, 17 different parts, and this is just in the business world what risk is. Right? 17 different parts. I want to get it all on one slide just to be impressive with this. I don't know what the font is. It must be like four, four font or something. But if I'm up here, I can read this, right? So, um, so some of the risks that, that we see here. Capital risk, number two. Losses from unrecovered loans will affect the financial institution's capital base and may necessitate, necessitate floating of a new stock or share issue. We've seen this in that companies that uh, had loans for people uh, uh, made loans to people have not been repaid. 
And so they have lost money. And the fact is, when they didn't have that, they lost money that was belonged to somebody else. Somebody had on account with them, and so they had to find a way to make up for that. That means that they can't make out as many, uh, they can't make as many loans. And this is what one of the things that happened in 2008 and continues today. The the more stringent loan practices are are based on this kind of risk. Uh, another kind of risk, one that I like, country risk. Economic and political changes in a foreign country will alter loan repayments from debtors. Right? How many new governments have we seen in Europe just in the past uh, well, week? You know, But in the past couple of years, there are new governments with new governments, new regimes who decide whether they want to honor the promises of their predecessors or not. You can go on further. Uh, political risk, political changes in a debtor's country will jeopardize debt service payments. That's another issue that we just had there. Refinancing risk, it will not be possible to refinance maturing liabilities or deposits when they fall due at economic cost and terms. This was a problem with people with adjustable rate mortgages. They wanted to refinance and yet they didn't have uh, equity in their homes any longer so they could not refinance and this has led to some uh, some people defaulting. So 17 different ways but that's a lot of words. I mean, you can't possibly read all this and take it in in just a few minutes. So the question is, what's more overriding than that? What's risk? Well, I prefer, as somebody who does inquiry-based learning, actually, um, I prefer to figure out what it might mean. And so this is a book that I'm in the midst of writing uh, on teaching risk measures through inquiry-based methods. Um, and I've taken a couple of ideas from this. So let's see, which of these do you consider a risky situation, if any? And there may be more than one answer, and there may be no answers, right? So one of those uh, tricky kinds of uh, multiple choice tests. Which situation or situations have an element of risk? You do not know who has packed your parachute, and you choose not to go skydiving. Is there any risk involved there? No, there's no risk as far as the parachute's concerned, right? Because you're not going skydiving. You do not know who has packed a parachute, and you choose to go skydiving. Marissa shaking her head yes. Yeah, there's some risk I'm there. Afraid of heights, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the last time you went skydiving, you felt this? Or? No, no, but I'm just saying. It scares me just to see the word up there. <laughs> All right. We'll, 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 we'll uh, go along quickly then. Well, you don't know who's packed your parachute, but you've gone skydiving, you're standing on solid ground. Is there any risk to that? It's already done, right? There's nothing to be done. So there's no risk involved. Now you already know what's happened. All right. So. I'll go through three of these, just because that's what I decided to do. I don't know. Uh, which of these would have risk if you work for a bank and decide who to loan to? I'm working more towards financial issues now, because uh, most of the people who study risk do so for financial reasons. I have a good friend at Clemson University who uh, is interested in uh, the weather. He does statistical analysis of weather. And of course, uh, in doing this for a few years, he got a phone call from someone on Wall Street and said, do you think that we can price some weather derivatives? And so of course they have, and he's back and forth to the street because there's a financial issue even based on weather. We saw that just, this, just the past couple of years with the wheat crops in Russia, with uh, the corn crops here in the United States, that there are risks associated with the weather, especially for people who are in agricultural areas. So. I'm working that way towards the financial aspects. So if you have a customer who may not repay a loan and you decide to loan to them, do you have risk? Mm -hmm. Okay, this may not be a customer, this may be a classmate, this may be a colleague, right? Somebody, uh, somebody down the hall in the office near you. And you have a customer who may not repay the loan and you decide not to loan to them. Is there any risk involved there? Really none, because you have no exposure to them failing to pay. And the final, you have already made a loan to a customer and the customer has already defaulted. Is there any risk involved in that? Well, in the past tense there was, but the defaults already occurred. You know what's going to happen. You know what has happened. So there's no question of what's going to happen. There's no risk involved. You've already lost. Right? So risk is gone. Third, and well, my favorite one. And you can see why. My favorite one, because I like to be a little off the wall. Um, country X has a lunatic leader, and you have money invested in Country X. Risky? Right. That could have been Libya, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Venezuela. Who knows? It may even be this country, right? Who, who knows who the, who the next leader will be, and we may decide to elect some lunatic. So it can be anywhere that this actually occurs. 
But if you have money in the, invested in that country, then you are beholden to what goes on in that country. Uh, if, you, if they have that same leader and you have no money invested, then it's no big deal. Right? You have no, you, now maybe uh, through chaos theory you can say that everything in every country affects another country, but the risk is minimal. It's as minimized as possible. You would have much more risk if you invested in the country. And then finally, if uh, this person's already confiscated all the money, uh, should I say, Hugo Chavez, right? Uh, he's taken, he's nationalized so many of the industries there. Um, if they've already invested it that you once had there, it's no longer yours, you no longer have any risk. You know exactly what happened. It's gone. So what's the prevailing theme? I try to lead this, the, the readers to see the common thread. And it's that uh, each of the above definitions, the 17 possible definitions, had in them, if you read through them carefully. And if you want the, the uh, slides, please let me know. I'll be glad to email them to you. If you want any of the papers I mentioned, I'll be glad to email you, email you those PDFs also. Um, but what we have are uh, a situation of risk that has both uncertainty and exposure to that uncertainty. So for some reason, you have some skin in the game. If you don't, if you choose not to put that parachute on, you're not going to go parachuting, there's no risk of what's going to happen. You have no exposure. On the other hand, if, uh, if there's no uncertainty, if you're already on the ground, if you've already landed and there's no uncertainty about what's going to happen, there's no risk either. And so Merriam-Webster uh, tells us that risk is the possibility of loss or injury. And injury here can be widely construed. Of course, it can be physical injury. Uh, our, uh, the, the students that go and play football put themselves at risk of energy. In energy. Injury. Loss of energy, right? But injury. Uh, we put ourselves at risk when you make a right turn onto 74, right? You put yourself at some, some possibility of injury because you don't know that the person's really going to stop for the red light. And so we all live with, these, with, these, uh, with risk every day, and we live with the knowledge that we, we have that risk. So um, the question then is, what's the most important piece of information with dealing risk, with risk? So for instance, I have a coin. I actually put one in my pocket so I could do this today. And if uh, I said, Jeremy, do you want to take the bet? I'll flip the coin, and if it's, you choose head or tails. Uh, tails. If it's tails, do you want to take a million dollar bet? If it's tails, I pay you a million dollars. If it's heads, you pay me a million dollars. Well, the average on that is zero. You do this many times, and statistically, probabilistically, there's going to be no, it's, we're not going to have any problems. We're going to owe, neither of us are going to owe the other one. The expectation in this sense is zero. So why wouldn't you take the bet? Because it's too risky. Well, how do you know it's risky? You could potentially lose seven figures if you would. <laughs> he's, he's right, isn't he? Right, that's, that's good knowledge, and if we had, I think, banks with more common sense like that, we might be in better shape. Oh, uh, Barry's giving me the look over there of, I'm saying the wrong thing now, right? Oh, well. Do you, you agree? More or less. Okay. Maybe so. Um, and so, uh, Jeremy recognizes he was at risk of losing a million dollars. Going on with the banks is what you were saying with the 50 to 50 chance mm -hmm. is they were saying if we flip the coin enough, enough times, times, right, we should at least come out even if not ahead. With statistics, there are tails involved, and you have to plan for those things. We'll get to this also. It's exactly right. You're exactly right, and you're looking at the risk already. So uh, if we go bungee jumping. What kind of if, if, if Marissa, you know, we'll pick on you since you love the heights so much, right? Yeah. What would you want to know if somebody says, you've got to go bungee jumping, you have to do it for some reason, I don't know. What would you want to know about where you choose to go? I want to know what the death rate is there. <laughs> um, I want to know when the cords were checked, um, who's bungeeing with me, what their experience is, um, how old the equipment is. What are you concerned about? The, the worst case scenario, right? Isn't there a television show now called Worst Case Scenario? We are, yeah, okay. Josh is telling me, yes, there is. And you like that one. All right. So what do you prepare for? 
the worst case scenario, right? This is the issue that we should be considering with risk. Not what do we expect to happen 50% of the time, not over the long run what might happen, but what is it, what is the worst possibility that could happen? And again, some people are blindly not considering what's the worst possibility. We'll make it up in the long run, right? As long as we're still solvent, as long as we're still alive, we'll make it up in the long run. If I jump a bunch of times, um, you know, it's more than likely most of those times I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to, you know, kill myself. But all it takes is once and I won't be bungee jumping anymore. And so we need to look at those worst case scenarios. And that's uh, where we get to the risk measures being defined. So uh, all about worst case scenarios. Uh, we want to look in the tails of probability distributions. When you have a probability distribution, there's a lot of stuff that happens normally. But then there are these things that are odd that happen nonetheless. We all know probably somebody who's won the lottery, right? Or know of someone who's won the lottery. Uh, there was a great sign on I-285 in Atlanta as you were coming on 285 to, from 85 to 285 that said somebody's going to win the lottery. And underneath it said, it's just not going to be you. So start planning for your future. And the fact is, it's mostly true. I've known, I knew one person who won a lottery twice. It's very, very rare to happen. But those are the kinds of situations that can happen. Now imagine it's the reverse lottery, right? And you end up in the situation where you lose that much twice. Well, welcome to the world of banks, right? They can lose that amount quite a bit. Or maybe your uh, retirement portfolio, right? And say you feel the same way. How could I have lost and I'm losing again? It's the risk that we have. So uh, we all buy insurance. Everybody here has some sort of health insurance, I would suppose. Disability insurance so that uh, the little duck will pay you money if you end up <laughs> in a bad situation. We also have life insurance too, especially I've got a wife and four children, and so if I were gone, uh, they would need something, some sort of financial uh, support to take care of them. And so we have these kinds of things because we in general think about these worst case scenarios. Now, in another sense, you could say I'm throwing away my premiums every year because I'm never using it. Might as well just go ahead and die and actually get the payoff. Or you can say, just in case that happens, I'm willing to hedge against that possibility uh, of the worst case scenario. And that's what we decide to do with health insurance, with automobile insurance, right? Disability, life, all, all of these kinds of insurances. And you can think of many other things as being insurance also. My sister uh, is just in the midst of buying a, a condominium just outside of New York City. And she and I were talking about the different kinds of loans that she could take whether an adjustable rate or a 15 or a 30 year or, and I, I spoke to her about if you take the longer loan, then you have more uh, freedom to make smaller payments if there come months when you need that. And you also can repay it more quickly and it's a very small price, you know, maybe 30 or $40 a month. You pay for insurance all the time and this is just the insurance of making sure that you can make the payments each month. And so then you have to determine, is that the insurance you want or not? I never buy the insurance like you know, when I bought the phone, or I just bought a phone and when I bought the phone I didn't pay the $20 insurance for an $80 phone. It didn't seem worthwhile to me. And we all make these decisions if you buy these things, uh, they've got these warranty plans now and that's just another form of insurance. I want to say that. All right, so what's a risk measure? This is my, what I study. And so a risk measure is a measure, which we call rho. Uh, we've got to use Greek letters so that we look uh, more erudite, I guess. And it satisfies these properties. It says that if you always have a return, if x is your position, and if the return on x is always non-negative, if it's always zero or larger, you have negative risk. Right? So you're going to get something back. You're assured you're going to get something back. It's, it's guaranteed. Then you have negative risk. The second part, the homogeneity says that if the uh, positive homogeneity says that if you are going to take uh, a risk, so if you decide to put in $100 and then later you decide to put in $1,000, your risk is 10 times larger. Your risk of loss is 10 times larger with $1,000 than it was with $100. Now, it can be argued that you should also be able to do this for negatives, so that here, if I have a negative return, my risk should be positive. That's implied in this, but not completely stated. Then translation invariance says that if I have a position and I hold an extra amount of cash, 
So if I have a position, I own some stock, and I also have some cash on the side. This cash lowers my risk of going bankrupt because if I get a margin call, uh, like the people with MF Global just did, uh, they, they thought they were safe. They had cash on hand, but it was confiscated from them for some reason. If you have extra cash on hand, you have a smaller probability of defaulting. In general, what we're going to look for from a risk measure is to tell us for a bank, for an individual, how much cash should you hold on hand to prepare for the catastrophic situations that are like that could occur um, so that you won't go bankrupt. Which explains why you have health insurance but not the home insurance. Right. That's a good point. All right. Everybody see what, what uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Cuff is talking about? I shouldn't say same thing. Yeah, well. So the two that are best known, the first one is the alpha value at risk. Now alpha is a level. It's a percentage of certainty that you want. This percentage is often 90%, 95%, or 99%. Just the common ones that are used. Uh, and the alpha value at risk of, the of a position is, uh, well, the negative, the infimum here, just means think of it as being the smallest thing that's possible. Uh, of the x is such that the probability that your loss is bigger than x is 1 minus alpha. So at 95%, 0.95, what you want to do is find I lose more money than this only 5% of the time. At <coughs> the 99% level, I lose more money than this amount only 1% of the time. Does that make sense? Okay, I want to make sure. Second, the alpha expected shortfall says in those situations, and this is the mathematical thing that's written, and I know there are some people who are not math people, right? In those situations in which I am going to lose, in those 1% of situations, or those 5% of situations, what's the average loss that I can expect? Because if I have a 5% risk of losing more than a million dollars, it may be I have 1% of losing a million, and 1% of losing 3 million, and 1% of losing 10 million, that's a bigger risk than just I have a 5% chance of losing a million dollars. When I get further and further in that tail, the losses mount and it, it's, it's bad news. This is what's happened. Now the thing to remember and what many people forget is if we have a 99% value at risk, that says that 1% of the time we're going to lose this amount or more. There are 252 trading days in a year. 1% of 252 is two and a half days. So every two years you expect five days to lose more than this amount. Leads to the reason that some of the, uh, the risk uh, requirements are what they are. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Then the expected shortfall, this is called other names, uh, the loss given default. This is called the uh, uh, tail conditional expectation, the conditional value at risk, many things like this. So if you go to read a paper, if you get inspired by the things you see today, and you decide to go read some of these research papers, know that the expected shortfall goes by many other names also. Right. Um, and so, uh, these are the two that are most commonly used. Uh, this is used every day when you think about uh, a deductible on insurance. Right. You, for uh, health insurance, we may have a thousand dollar deductible, which means you're responsible for the first thousand dollars. And then after that, it will be picked up maybe at some percentage or maybe completely. This idea of the value at risk is that that is the deductible and then this is the amount you should expect to lose beyond that original deductible once you get into the situation where you are going to lose. Once you, once you get into the situation where you have to use the insurance. So the alpha value at risk can be thought of as a deductible while the expected shortfall is the amount beyond that deductible that would have to be paid out. And this has been done for many years in actuarial tables. Uh, insurance companies have, have been doing this for actually hundreds of years, cal calculating these things. And yet these two have only gotten the name alpha value at risk and alpha expected shortfall within the last uh, 20 years or so. So they're fairly new concepts. Uh, as far as being named, but they're really old concepts too in the fact that people have studied these before. So, uh, regulatory issues. I, I promised to talk about regulation. So, uh, some of the regulatory issues are uh, in Basel, Switzerland, there's a Basel Committee for Banking Supervision and they make the ba uh, banking regulations for the top 20 uh, economies in the world. Right? However, most other countries beyond those first 20 
also follow the regulations just to be compliant. Not only that, many of the banks and the holding companies that would be subject to these laws are transnational anyhow. They have branches maybe in Jakarta, Indonesia, but also in London, and so they're held accountable to these. Um, in the first two Basel Accords, the Basel Committee required the use of the value at risk. Uh, in fact, what they said is the 10-day 99% value at risk, you need to hold three times more than that amount. Uh, finally, um, this uh, actually should be the 1% because they use the 99%. Only the last 1% of the, the value at risk only tells the last 1% uh, of the risk and not how bad you are in one of those 1% of the cases that we're going to encounter two and a half times a year anyhow. So, uh, the first paper I wrote was with uh, Dominique Guégan, who is at the University of Paris 1, uh, Pantheon Sorbonne, uh, and it's now at the Annals of Finance. Uh, this was something I did actually when I was writing a master thesis um, a few years ago. Um, and then after I finished a doctorate, so for those people who know, they need to know I'm at the top, uh, I've got the top degree and the university's doing good, right? Got to make sure that that's all because if it goes out someplace. All right. Um, so what I was able to show was, first of all, it was well known that many situations look, to look the same under the value at risk. And again, that situation of you have a 5% chance of losing a million dollars or you have 1% of a million and 1% of 3 million and 1% of larger and larger amounts. Those look exactly the same to the 95% the value at risk. That could be a problem. Uh, uh, investors, individuals, regulators need to know what the potential disaster can be. Um, further, I've been able to show, and as far as I know, I'm the first one to, to be able to do this, and we keep getting this, that this is the first one we've seen on this, uh, that things can look the same even if you ask for more information from a bank. We often ask for more information. If somebody asks you, uh, hey, do you want to go in on this investment? The correct question is, well, which investment? Tell me more about it. Who's involved in all that? People ask you if you want to go on a blind date. Well, tell me about the person. Oh, great personality, right? That's the first thing you always hear. Well, tell me more, right? And so we're always looking for more information. We always want to know more about the situation. You're all laughing. You've been on those blind dates? Oh, no, you a ask for more information no matter what. That's all I'm going to say. And so that's what I would say is the bank should give more information. It's easily calculated. They push one button and all the information can come out. Uh, however, that's a little more difficult on the regulators because now they have to follow two numbers or three numbers instead of only one. Most regulators don't want to follow more than one number. Uh, there's a famous quote that says, the reason that value at risk is used by regulators is it's so easy to regulate. Now, nobody is concerned about does it really tell anything about what will happen or what can potentially happen. The question is, is it easy to regulate? So I leave you with that one. Uh, oh, this one didn't turn out so well. These are four situations where if you use the 95 and 99% value at risk, the 95 and 99% expected shortfall, and something called the maximum loss, which by the model is the most that's possible to lose, these all have the same uh, calculation for all four of those measures, all five of those measures. So a regulator looking at all these pieces of information is not going to know which situation the bank might be in. This is a case of a flat risk, what's called uniform. Here is increasing and decreasing. You can think of situations where you have increasing and decreasing risk as banks that might uh, invest, uh, have loans in different neighborhoods. There are good neighborhoods and there are bad neighborhoods. And once a neighborhood starts having several foreclosures, it seems that there are more and more. Think about Detroit. A few foreclosures, a closing of a plant, it continues down the hill. And you actually see a rising in the probability. As more and more houses are defaulted, people say, why should I pay when nobody else is? Why should I live in a blighted neighborhood? I'm going to walk away also. And so the first kind of comments I had on this paper was these, these don't happen. Uh, risk doesn't ever increase. And the quick answer back was look at Detroit and tell the banks in Detroit that because it did increase and it continues to do so. Selling houses for a dollar now in Detroit. All right. So the problem was, for me, the problem was that for 20 years, only the 10-day 99% VAR was required by the Basel Committee. Uh, and then there were no papers out there that determined, is this a good measure? Does it actually measure what it purports to measure? 
Remember, the value at risk says that only 1% of the time should I see losses greater than this amount. Nobody even bothered to go back to returns and say, do we see this, this amount 1% of the time or not? So, um, I decided to look at historical measures on indices, uh, stock market indices, four of the most common ones, I'll, we'll get to those in a minute, and also in energy markets to see if this risk measure makes sense. You would expect indices to be a little more uh, uh, settled, I guess, and you would expect more volatility from the energy markets. If you remember, the price of oil very famously was nearly $150 a barrel just a few years ago. It dropped to 40 and is now back right at 100 uh, for the West Texas Intermediate that we consider here. So you'll see this in just a minute. So this is a uh, submitted, this is a, a paper that I've written, uh, Historical Risk Measures on Energy Markets and Stock Market Indices. It sits with the Journal of Risk Model Validation right now. Um, and I look at uh, both of these and now I've expanded over time frames. Not only can we change the level, the 99%, 95%, 90% assurance, we can say, well, what if I look at the last 10 days and I get my information? Now, what if I look at a longer time frame, 20 days or 50 days or 100 or 250, a full year, two years? Will that change things? And so there were some surprising results. Uh, the first thing is I found that there are many times when the expected shortfall this uh, amount after uh, the value at risk, the average after the value at risk, it just doesn't exist because there's not a violation of the value at risk. If you have nothing beyond the value at risk, you have a zero from the numerator, but you also have no days for the denominator. And you can't divide zero by zero no matter how many times you try. And it's an indeterminate form, I guess, and you gotta do something with it. It doesn't work out. There were a few times, and you see the, this, these are the, the times, in fact, uh, the 20 day, 95%, you can see 35% of the time, almost uh, constantly, it didn't. The assets I'm looking at are Brent crude, that is the most common in Europe, the CAC 40, which is the French index, the DAX, which is the German index, the Dow, which uh, the Dow Jones 30 industrials you probably know here in the United States, uh, gasoline, the price of gasoline per gallon, uh, the price of heating oil, that's the HO2. Uh, the S&P 500, which is a, a, a good measure here in the US too. It's another US-based uh, um, stock index. And then West Texas Intermediate, which comes out of Cushing, Oklahoma. It's the most common, uh, commonly cited price for oil we see here in the US. So I looked at these and I found, in fact, the expected shortfall doesn't even exist mo much of the times. There are only five different places where it does. And it doesn't start until 100 days that we get enough violations. When we go 100 days, we start to see violations of the 90% VAR. When we go 250 days, we, we, we not start, but we regularly see those enough violations to work for us. And then 500 days, which is two years. But you also see that the 99% levels still don't work. I've got a couple where it exists. There's no, there are no non-existences. But still, uh, even at 500 days, I don't get this 99% VA uh, expected shortfall of work. All right, so that's just more or less here. I say this, that 100 day, 90%, 250, 90, 250, 95, 590, and 595 are the only ones that I have information for. So the question was, how good is the VAR then? I looked at the prediction errors. So uh, the value at risk might predict that over a certain time I should see a hundred days, maybe for uh, you know, several years, I said sh should see a hundred days where I see something, uh, 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 losses beyond, who knows, we'll make a number, a million dollars. What I was told by this value at risk, uh, these value at risk measures is, uh, for Brent crude, if the prediction was a hundred days, I actually saw 92 days. 92 and a half days of that violation. If it was the CAC 40 and I said that there should be 100 days, I actually saw 98, maybe 99 days, right? So the error was that. Towards the bottom end though, remember last time the 500 day existed, the 250 day, towards the bottom end, if I expected 100 <coughs> days where I would see a loss beyond the, a certain level, uh, for West Texas Intermediate, for oil, I see 135 days, and that's a big difference. You think you're gonna lose a certain amount only 100 days and you lose 135 days, or 146 when you look at the S&P 500. These were not very good measures. 
when it's supposed to predict 100 and it predicts 104, uh, when it's supposed to, it predicts 100 and actually 146 is what occurs. And these are over about 30 years of data for each of these. So it's, it goes through several booms and busts in, in the markets. Uh, and you can see there are problems. The Brent crude tended to do pretty well, which of course surprised me because people talk about the volatility of oil prices. Uh, but that's Brent. When you look over, which is the more common in Europe, when you look over at the WTI, you can see it's a little wilder. Okay, so there we go. Uh, so when you do the regression on time and on level, on time frame and on level, you find that with larger time frames uh, and with larger uh, levels, you see increasing uh, error rates. So uh, for the value at risk. Uh, for the expected shortfall, on the other hand, these are the only five places where it works. So these are the only five that I tried. And you look at these errors, and mo all of them have point zero zero, and then something, right? Negative point zero zero in most cases. And so the negative here implies that, uh, that it's the losses we would expect are actually occurring less. So for instance, with the Brent crude here, when you look at the 100% 100-day 100 90%, uh, if the prediction was that you would lose a million dollars on uh, what, whatever uh, the your average beyond the value at risk would be a loss of a million dollars, what this is saying is actually the numbers show that it was two thousand five hundred ninety-six dollars less than that million. So it was a pretty conservative measure. So, and you can see they all turned out to be negative, they all turned out to be very small, but you have to remember the difference between this. Value at risk is the one predicting how many days you're going to ex experience the loss. This expected shortfall is saying what is the average beyond your deductible in some sense. Okay. So, from this we ended up, uh, I ended up making some uh, suggestions. Uh, I noticed that the value at risk was more conservative at the 10 day 90% and 20 day 90%. Uh, it was the most accurate at 250-day 90%, which was surprising. When you just consider the absolute error, it was up and down, but when you consider the absolute error, it was very small all the way across the board. Uh, the expected shortfall was most conservative at 250-day 95% and most accurate at 250-day 90%. These, it's not surprising these go together because in order to find the expected shortfall, you have to first compute the value at risk. And the value at risk is doing a good job, you expect the expected shortfall should probably do a good job too. Uh, so my suggestion to regulators is stop just asking for the 10-day 99% value at risk, the end of the day 99%, and instead ask for some extra information. If you do this, you have conservative measures and you have accurate measures. You have short-term 10-day, 20-day, but you also have a longer-term focus. And it seems, as I'm reading the tea leaves over in Europe and here in the U.S., that all that they're trying to do, the regulators are trying to do, all of the central banks are trying to do is make it till the end of the week and then make it to the end of next week. And there's not necessarily a coherent idea of what to do. These measures have a longer looking um, forecast than just the next 10 days. You might use the 10 and the 20 day to say these are things that you need to take care of right away with working towards being covered by the 250 day measures. So we'll see what they have to say about that, uh, if anything. So there are further problems with the Basel Committee, and this is where I go from doing some math to meddling, isn't that what we call it? And saying that there are further problems beyond the mathematics. And, uh, and I've got good reasons for saying this. So, and mathematical reasons nonetheless, too. In the original two Basel Accords, uh, I'm looking at, a, at writing a paper on this. I don't have anything. I want to do it. It would be controversial. I'll probably do it. Okay. The sovereign debt, in the original two, the sovereign debt was given a risk weighting of zero for the G10 countries. And you notice I've put one in capital letters. Okay. Probably should have put this one in capital letters too. But uh, you, I put, I've got that one in capital letters because we're going to come back to it. These 10 countries, yeah, there's no risk. They're always going to pay you back. You're always going to get all of your money back if you, if you uh, pay them. That's what the Basel Accords say, is what you should expect. On the other hand, corporate debt should have 100% risk weighting, no matter which corporation it might be. Pets.com, 100%, it's, it's trouble. Apple and Microsoft, the same thing. GM, 100%. Well, let's take a look. 
perverse incentives here. Right now, if you look at the debt and the credit default swaps, uh, the, the bonds that are trading for these two, you'll find that the, you can calculate through the, the bond prices and the uh, credit default swaps that there's an implied default rate of, la of Apple of less than half a percent. This was two days ago. This was even after uh, uh, the death of Steve Jobs. Yeah, I got it wrong in a class. I was about to say Bill Gates. Steve Jobs, right? Uh, after the death of Steve Jobs, they still think there's less than a half a percent chance that, that Apple's going to default on its debt. However, Italy, even with the new government, right? So two days, 7.8% uh, is what the markets think the, percent, the, the default rate will be, is that they expect there's about a 7.8% probability that we'll see a default in Italy. Okay. Greece is a little higher than that. All right. So, if you had the choice, who do you trust? Do you trust Apple or do you trust Italy? It's for you to decide. I'm not going to make those calls for anybody. However, what the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision and what the rules for those G20 countries, and then that are followed by most of the other countries too. By the way, those are voluntary. Even the G20 countries don't have to follow them, but by they've always done it. Uh, they've always followed them. Uh, I want to make sure that's clear too. But uh, you, know, you can determine, do you trust Italy or do you trust Apple more? All right. Moreover, there was this regulatory arbitrage. So uh, all the G10 debt was considered at 0% risk, so it made sense to seek the highest yield. All right. There's no risk. The regulators aren't going to give me any problem by investing in these bonds, so I'm going to invest in the bonds that give me the highest yield. Makes the most sense. On the other hand, uh, that also gave a huge hot conflict of interest because the only people who got that 0% were those top 10 countries. And guess who made the rules? Right, there were those 20 countries, but uh, heavily populated by those first 10 countries. They made the rules, and the rules said, our debt's good, now the other people are risky. It seems a little bit of a conflict of interest. Uh, they've, they've tried to correct that, but with this third Basel Accord, which is just about to go into, or just has gone into, uh, into effect. So they've tried to correct that somewhat by looking at credit rating agencies, which is a whole other paper in and of itself of the lag time, uh, you know, uh, we're all AAA until we're not. Right. So uh, the same was true for any corporate debt. If you went to pets.com, you might have gotten more yield than you did from someone else. The bank's going to look at, the regulator's going to look at the same way. We're going to chase the yield. It's what banks do. They, they chase returns. All right. Moreover, it's what we did as U.S. consumers. Nobody wants to talk about this. This is uncomfortable to do. We did the same thing. Maybe I should turn my back, right? We did the same thing. We wanted more than we could afford. We all do. We wanted a nicer house, a nicer car. We wanted electronic gadgets, whether it was the new phone or the new uh, whatever computer. I don't know. Uh, we all wanted them. And so we could take on the debt. The bank said that's no problem. Their house has equity in it, and it will continue to increase in value because houses always increase in value. And as long as it always increases in value, it's fine. They're going to pay off the debt because there's equity there. And if not, we'll seize the house, we'll sell it, and we'll make the money, the equity that's there, and it will pay back the loans that they didn't have, uh, that they didn't have the money for. And of course, this worked all the way up until it didn't. And uh, then the bank stopped lending so freely. We got the problems of 2008, which continues in the real estate markets today. Foreclosed upon houses. Uh, you don't have to drive very far, and you go past several of them, even right here close to the campus. All right. So if the next problem is not that it's consumers that can't repay, but it's nations that can't repay, what's going to happen? That's a good question. It's unprecedented in some sense. Uh, we've seen this happen before. Iceland defaulted just a few years ago. Uh, Germany has defaulted twice in the past hundred years. Right? Uh, the United States has defaulted a few times. Uh, we haven't wanted to call it default, but we have reneged on promises also. Uh, the most recent being in 1971, but in the early years there were several defaults. Um, ben Bernanke, though, has said it's no problem. We'll always pay back our, our, uh, our debts. Because the Federal Reserve can print money. He said this in congressional testimony. And everybody goes, he said that? He did. I believe the question was from Ron Paul, actually. He said, we, can, we, we will always pay back our debts because uh, we can print the money. Italy's in a different situation. 
It's part of the European Monetary Union. It does not have the right to print its own currency. It has to have agreement from the other nations and from the European Central Bank, Bank in order to do so. Greece is in the same situation, Portugal, Italy, Spain. More and more people are talking about Belgium, even Austria, I didn't put it here, France, even Germany. That these countries may be in trouble because they do not control their own currency. So they cannot determine how to pay people back. So this could be uh, the next paper too. It's, of course, it's great because we're going to be kept in research for the next hundred years just based on what's going on in these couple of days, these couple of months. Uh, so what's happened? Well, the expected. Nobody wants Greek bonds. They don't trust Greece. Nobody trusts Greece to pay back. Greece has tried to get a 50% haircut. Uh, that is that if they owed you $100, they, or 100 euros, they now want to pay you 50 euros back. Right? And they can't even come to an agreement on that. Right? So it may be bigger than that. So what's happened? Well, the Greek one-year debt has blown out. If you want a wonderful return, assuming they pay it back, put 100 euros into Greece, and one year from now, you'll get your 100 euros back plus an extra 250 euros and uh, 76 cents. Uh, 76 on teams, right? So 350 euros for the price of 100 a day if they pay it back. Right? If instead you want uh, the two-year debt, you get 110 euros in one year, and then your 100 plus another 110 in two years. Italy, and, and that's just, that's crazy. It's uh, the last time a country got over 120% yield was Argentina, and they very quickly defaulted thereafter. Honestly, I've been amazed that they've been able to keep this going. With all the risk that's going on, I've been amazed they've been able to keep things going. It's, it's uh, a great credit to the central bankers that they've been able to, uh, to continue with these kinds of things happening. Uh, Italian debt has gone over 7%. Um, and then it got smacked right back down. The European Central Bank, it looks like, intervened, which is against its charter. Uh, but in two minutes, when the yield goes from 7.9% to 6.1%, somebody did something. Uh, there's no telling who it would be. It, it's speculative to say that it's the European Central Bank. It could have been, uh, you know, uh, Warren Buffett. I don't know. Somebody could have bought several hundred billion dollars in Italian bonds to, to help them out. Uh, but. On the, other, on the flip side, the U.S. Treasuries are yielding 0.11% as of the 15th again, and 0.26% uh, on the two years. You notice that this is uh, a normal yield curve rather than inverted, uh, which means that if you are willing to give up your money for longer periods of time, you get a higher interest rate. It's the same with CDs. Short-term CDs, you get less money. Uh, banking accounts, you get, savings accounts, you get almost nothing, right? Uh, but if you'll tie it up for 30 days or 60 days or, or something, the interest that they're willing to pay you goes longer and longer, up to five years for sure. And so, uh, there we go. Uh, so, why? Well, people trust the U.S. The US Treasuries. They trust that uh, those are going to be repaid and they're willing to forego the extra uh, return that you could get by buying Italian or Greek debt. Right? They're willing to forego that for the assurance that they're going to have their money returned to them because Bernanke said he'll do it. Uh, but many banks have large exposure to European debt. Many US banks and many international banks. And that has a potential for lending. Okay. So here we go. Uh, you can see the date up here, the uh, 9th of November. So this was about a week ago. This is old information because it's about a week ago. Uh, Goldman Sachs had, the, had exposure to, the, to Portugal, Italy, uh, Ireland, Greece, and Spain of 4.16 billion US dollars and their market cap is 49.1 billion. Now imagine that this exposure is like with Greece and half of it's gone. That means they lose two billion dollars of their market capitalization, the, the, the amount of money that their, their uh, shareholders are worth, uh, that, that the shares of their stock are worth. It's likely to very quickly, for, because of efficient market hypothesis, it would be likely to drop very quickly. The one that seems to be the most problem here is the Bank of America, right here in Charlotte, of course. Uh, they have nearly one quarter, maybe 20% to 25% of their market capitalization uh, is at risk with, the bank, with uh, what we affectionately call the pigs, or not so affectionately. All right. So people are beginning to notice this, and I, I pull, pulled three articles. Uh, this middle one is a, an interesting uh, interview. ABC here is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, not the uh, American. So 
Interesting. Uh, but this first business week piece, financial alchemy foils capital rules as banks redefine risk. There's a little neat little thing in these Basel uh, Accords that say that banks are allowed to use their own internal risk models that they want. And so they change them when it suits them. And not once have I seen a bank change its risk uh, models to say, we need to put more money on account. Every time it's to say, oh no, we've got more money, we got enough money, we can risk more. Which leads to the second one, which is a very interesting case. Uh, Jonathan Sugarman, who resigned, who was the chief risk officer for unit credit, and when they asked him to break the laws, uh, allegedly, according to him, he then left, so as not to put himself in the risk of jail. Uh, this, this is what he says in the interview. You should watch it, you should read the transcript, whatever you want to do. Uh, about a 20 minute interview. Uh, but they also have Nick Leeson, who was the, the man who brought down the 235-year-old Barings Bank in the UK by being a rogue trader. Recently we've seen, is it Kwaku Adabolu, I think is the guy's name, was another one that was uh, convicted of, uh, or indicted for being a rogue tra trader. Uh, when I was in France, there was another one, Jerome Curviel. Somebody is not paying attention to what people are doing and the risk that they're taking. It's pretty clear. And then the Financial uh, Times piece talks about what's happening with MF Global when MF Global uh, uh, confiscated apparently $600 billion from its customers. No, $600 million from its customers. I said billion. Million from its customers. All right, so um, that's, that's the end of the story. I wanted to point this out because this is about the Spivey uh, Award, the things that I've been able to do and why I would recommend if you haven't done the Spivey. Barry, have you had the Spivey before? You should apply. You've got some ideas. You can see this. Each of you. John, you've, have you done it? I recommend it if you, if you can. <laughs> I know. I'm the problem, right? <laughs> we talked about that. Anyway, uh, these are some of the things I was able to do. I've got a piece that's, occur it's, that's in a, uh, a book that's coming out this year. Uh, three papers that are submitted. One that's about ready. One that I worked on with this guy here through a summer program, a summer research grant that Wingate, is, Wingate has. If uh, any of the students are interested in some of these kinds of questions, uh, please come by. Let's talk about working on some stuff together. Um, I think all your professors would say that, but uh, to work on research together is, is one of the greatest things we can do. Um, and then I've got a textbook that's also in, uh, in the midst of being uh, put together. It's not ready. It's not even close. It'll be there eventually. Uh, some talks that I've given, uh, I've been invited to go to the London School of Economics and this, Decem this December, I was there last December to give another talk. Um, I went to the Financial Education Association Conference with uh, Kristen Stowe and with Lisa Schwartz and Ken Cole Aron also gave a talk there. And then uh, I also gave a talk at UNCC. I've been invited to several different uh, conferences and was able to go because of this award. Uh, so I'm very thankful to the committee for choosing me because it's opened up a lot of possibilities for me. Uh, and I've been to places all over the world. I spent the summer in France, as I, as I show here, I spent the summer in France. I got to teach a course at the Paris School of Economics um, called Probabilistic and Statistical Methods in Finance. Uh, that came both from a grant through the uh, Academy for Inquiry-Based Learning, uh, through which I'm writing this textbook and also through the Spivey uh, committee <laughs> generosity with me. And so, thank you. Certainly, thank you to the Spivey committee for allowing me to pursue some of these ideas. And the only thing is I want another one now, and, and you can only do this once, so uh, it's, it's kind of bad news. Uh, you get so excited about being able to work on these questions and to talk to people about some ideas, um, and then you, you hit reality again, and that's it. So are there questions that you have? I'd be glad to take any kind of questions. This, this might just serve to, to illustrate my ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the arguments that I have, have heard uh, with regard to how much capital uh, one mm -hmm. sets aside is that if you set too much mm -hmm. aside, that in and of itself is a risk because um, other entities who are willing to take more risk right. will be able to advance faster. Was, your, your capital reserves are essentially absolutely. a ball and chain. That's absolutely and at what... Evaluate that sort of 
meta risk. So, so that's the, the issue is that we all want our returns this quarter. I have a retirement account just like you do, right? And I've got a, a stock portfolio also, and I want good returns on that. Uh, however, when you do that, you also put yourself at risk of going bankrupt, of, of as they say in the markets, blowing up and having nothing left over. Uh, so what do you say to this? You're seeking the wrong kinds of ideas, is, is what I would say. Sure, you get paid today, you get paid tomorrow, but sometime down the road, this risk is going to catch up. And I may be safe uh, walking on a high wire across Niagara Falls once or twice or three times. But why would I keep trying that? Because eventually, I'm going to run out of luck. Is that if, mm -hmm. if you are successful enough at the time, you, are cr you essentially crowd out the others who are being more conservative and thus reduce your risk. And that's the argument, of course. Uh, and, this, and this works, again, until it doesn't, right? That's the whole thing. This works well until it doesn't. And when that time comes, uh, when you get into that last 1% of the probability, then your losses may be so monumental that they overwhelm the extra uh, money that you had created all along the way. And this whole thing with MF Global, I just saw the first hedge fund is going out of business. They say, when we're in a regulatory situation where we cannot assure our clients safety of their money, we don't want to be in this, this uh, situation. And I'm sure there will be more fallout from this, this being lost. But this, this is exactly the problem. People are competing one against the other one. And we who want more and more for our money, you know, what, what we have, we don't want to have to pay more. We want just to give the money to somebody and it magically grows like uh, beans in a, a children's story, right? We want the magic beans that make everything grow. That's why I've got stuff in TI. <laughs> Absolutely. This is what we want. And we're happy as long as it continues to grow. But then, as probabilities catch up to us, we all of a sudden are unhappy. That's and so, yeah, and so <laughs> the, you often hear that Wall Street is a legalized casino. Right? And it's gambling. And if we're willing to admit that, then we're OK. But many people see it as, I'm investing, and this is going to continue to grow all along. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then you probably want a small amount of risk. If you need it to grow immediately right now, you're going to have to take more risk. As we know, nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? If you don't take risk, you don't get the reward. Or as a Russian friend of mine used to say, he who takes no risk never drinks the vodka. Yeah. So uh, if you don't take risk, you don't get these finer things in life. But you may slowly accumulate along the way. And so that's the question, right? I mean, uh, we have bailed out how many banks in this country for how much money? If you look at the papers that I, that I showed earlier, and again, I'm happy to send the slides to y'all. There are places you can just click directly into those stories if you want. I have a question. Uh, ahead, Barry. Most of the financial experts that I've talked to, people that are in finance, they tell me we had to bail out the bank. I'm not 100% sure I believe that, but almost every one of them has told me we've had to. And I guess I'd be curious of your uh, impression on that. Whether I mean, it, I mean, I think my sense is that part of the problem is that whether it's real or not, the perception is that the economy is tanking, so it's reduced spending, it, it's, it's essentially choked itself off, and would that have been better had we let a few more of these banks go down? I don't know. That, I guess that's what I'd like to know. It's hard to argue the counterfactual, for one thing, right? So the fact that we can't go back and do it a different way makes it impossible to argue. Uh, further, I don't know that I'm somebody who should step into the political realms of these kinds of things. But you've asked me, and I'm not going to duck a question, so uh, my uninformed opinion would be that uh, you could have gone either way if you were willing to take the pain that came from it. Now, we seem to continue to have to have more and more small bailouts. Somebody else, something else. I'm sure that these, these customers are going to be made whole on their accounts. I feel confident that some insurance will come along and will do it. But uh, we look at Bank of America, and they have just moved $73 trillion. That's a big number. $73 trillion worth of derivatives onto their balance sheet uh, in places where they would be covered by anybody who has uh, an account with Bank of America. The first money, if they lose their money, the first money to be taken away would be those that come from customers. It's a very 
a smart ploy because those customers are covered up to $250,000 by the FDIC. So nobody's going to lose any money, well, except the U.S. government through its insurance program right, if it goes bad. Well, that's one way of looking at it, yeah. And so we continue to, to pile risk upon risk. And at some point, maybe we need to deliver some of this risk. It's the only thing I would say. Uh, do we do it through regulation? Eh, I don't know. Do we do it through failing to bail people out? I mean, you invite moral hazard when you, invite, when you bail people out. That's what happens with the 73 trillion. It's a moral hazard that they attempted, at least, to put on the books. And originally, everybody said it's okay for them to do this. All the regulators said, yeah, it's no problem. Let them do this. All right? You invite the moral hazard of taking higher and higher uh, risks. It's kind of like the idea with seat belts. When people didn't uh, wear seat belts, the idea was that they would drive slower to be safe. Now we have seat belts and airbags, we can go a whole lot faster and take on more risk because we've got the insurance behind us. And so this is the same kind of moral hazard we may be seeing. Um, uh, I would not have bailed them out, but that's because I come from a particular school of economics that says that. Uh, others You're would have. I'm often in the minority. I'm the crazy yeah, one, Barry. You know yeah, that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I felt the same. I mean, I felt like maybe we had to bail a few of them out, but I, I just felt like we went way too far with that. That um, it hasn't helped the perception, which is. So, so why do we have this Occupy Wall Street mo movement? They bailed out all of the big corporations, and people are saying, "Well, why don't? Where's mine?" And this is the moral hazard that was invited by that, and uh, and will continue to persist. You know? Yeah. And many people will make the arguments, as you said, that you had to bail them out or else the whole system would go down. If I go bankrupt, nobody cares. I mean, it's not going to hurt anybody else. My bank might be upset because I don't pay back a couple of loans, but that's it. I don't bring the whole system down. If, uh, if Lehman goes bankrupt, oh well, never mind. If AIG goes bankrupt, right, this would cause the whole system to come down, so we have to do something. And that, of course, that's the argument. Uh, you can buy that, you can not buy that. I see good arguments on both sides, and I have my bias, but that's all it is, is a bias as to which it is, uh, which way it goes, so. Your, your, your risk analysis, mm -hmm. as best as I can see it, they don't seem to be a, a retro... Yeah, it's all historical. All, all historical. Mm -hmm. uh, but wouldn't a related problem be that we create uh, products and devices which are so recent that you really can't make that sort of determination? Well, you do by trying to find synthetic uh, objects which are very close to what it is. The way that we price these is by saying this is very similar to something else. So if Apple brings out their new iPhone, they say the last one cost about $200, so the next one ought to cost something similar. And th it's the idea also behind many of the new financial products. Well, when you pay for insurance on something, it's about like this. And so when we pay for insurance on something else, it should be about like that. And so you can use this as a guide, but the question is, how are people going to react to it? You go beyond the numbers. Uh, finance is about so much more than numbers. Many of the last couple of uh, Nobel Prizes in economics, so in the past 10 years, they've been giving more and more uh, Nobels to people in behavioral economics which are people who study, once something happens, how do people react to it? Right? And so, in some sense, you can't predict those things. In another sense, you've got to try. <laughs> and so that's what happens. Um, yes, it's, it's a problem. The historical risk measures are what are used by these committees. And wh that is why I looked at them specifically. One of the things that I had heard in the news is that um, uh, the way mortgages were being handled mm -hmm. Um, it distributed, on the one hand, distributed risk. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it made it almost impossible for an investor to figure out the actual risk they were taking. The few people who have actually gone through the credit, uh, the, the I'm sorry, collateralized debt obligations, these big mm -hmm. things that have done, uh, that, that have been looked at, uh, the one guy who's most famous for, for it, he said the only reason he was able to go through all of it is because he has Asperger's sy syndrome which leads him to want to go through things very, very carefully. And he said nobody else would have done this. And so uh, he made a lot of money, though, by going through and saying, these are all terrible. They have low lending standards, and they're all going to default. And so he bet against them and was right. You've got uh, 
a focus here on the asset values and you can choose any currency that you want right. so that you have a constant mm -hmm. Um, a numerator. How have you factored into this, or how could you factor into this, uh, the same kind of phenomenon that's going on in currency fluctuations? Um, I can see how you could arrive at some conclusions on the basis of just asset values with a standard measure of meters or whatever, but uh, when the meter stick is changing, how do you, uh, how do you build that into your probabilities? Well, you have to uh, go into you have to go to something that is you you have one numerator maybe the U.S. dollar and then you look at the the, the fluctuating rates of the euro and everything else and you make the conversion of if this is worth so many euros how many U.S. dollars would it be worth and then with the fluctuating currency uh, the, the FX rates as well as the cost of an asset then you can do the multiplication or the division as necessary in order to determine what it would be in that constant dollar. And you can change South African Rand or um, you know, Japanese Yen or anything into one standard currency. Do you think it would be possible to solve those two sets of equations simultaneously and get uh, some sort of probability uh, depending on either the currency that you Shows or a basket of currencies that you chose. So, when you say the two equations, you mean regression equations, looking well, at the statistical you have one models set of math that you're using for the asset evaluation. You've right. Shown us. Right. And uh, I'm thinking a similar analysis could be made of currencies. Yes. And then, if you combine those two to see how they the, the, inter, the variables of each of those interplay with each other. Do you think it'd be possible uh, it, to it, solve a set of equations that might give you some insight there? I believe it is. I hope it is because I'm giving a talk about it in London here in uh, about uh, six weeks. So uh, as I'm as I'm getting a little further on it, uh, I'll be glad to, to talk with you about this. Uh, I bought the data to do it, and I have yet to run all of these uh, regressions. So um, I'm hopeful. Yeah, it's a big challenge. It is. It's it's huge because you've got all of, all of the things, and it's been amazing to me with going to the statistical side, um, how many eight and ten sigma moves we've seen. I had to look up ten sigma. It's one and one hundred thirty-two sextillion possibility of something happening, and I have seen more and more what they call ten sigma moves, very out of the ordinary moves, things that nobody expected to see, because of the political risk, because of a country risk. Somebody starts changing things, the ECB or someone else, and there's a quick reaction to it, and it causes this incredible change that, uh, that nobody could predict. Wall Street has a new name for 10 Sigma. They call it Black Swan. Yep. Nassim Taleb is a, a great, uh, if anybody who's a statistician watches, uh, they would disagree with me. But uh, because he takes some good shots at statisticians, and some of them are fair and some of them are unfair. But one of the things that Nassim Taleb talks about are that there are things that we cannot see, we cannot imagine happening, that happen nonetheless. And so you have to take into account somehow the things that are unimaginable could happen, and yet there's no way for us to measure those things. Now he tries to do this on the level that uh, people like, uh, like us can understand instead of the high-powered statisticians. And the high-powered statisticians don't appreciate that. But uh, he has two books. One's called Fooled by Randomness, and the other is called The Black Swan, the something about the improbable. I don't remember what it is. Something about the improbable. Uh, and they're, they're good. They're easy uh, reads, as far as I was concerned. Uh, but they're, they're good books that I would recommend. Uh, you're right. We've seen so many of these things, though. And it's just it's volatile. It seems like a lot of people have their stomachs in knots and they don't know what's coming next. And well, that's pretty much all of us, isn't it? Who knows? Other things? All right. Well, thank you. There's still food over here. So. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir.